Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and you are about to watch the October 27th DevOps uh, Lunch and Learn, our weekly session. This was about SmartNICs, and we had VMware's Kit Colbarian to talk about their initiatives in Product Monterey, and it was great. We went super down in the weeds about the whys and the hows and the whats and the wherefores. Uh, totally great session. Please, if you have ideas or things that you want to share with us or be part of the discussion, join the2030.cloud. Sign up for one of our weekly sessions. Come to all of them. Um, we talk tactical on Tuesdays and strategic on Thursdays. Everybody did. Sounds good. I, uh, I did just finish a call where people were talking about um, NVIDIA. There, there was an acquisition today. Xilinx uh, got acquired yep. for a lot of money. Ooh, yeah. Neat. 31 billion. A lot of money, but um, it wasn't that far above their stock, their current going stock price. It was what uh, twenty a share above, kind of I think. So I mean, it wasn't that far off of their valuation, but that was that was nice to see. Actually, I think that was a smart move by AMD. Why? What's what's your what's your what's your read? What's your hot take? Um, my read is that it removes a dependency from AMD for system building and for bringing um, mid-range prototyping boards, but it also, so AMD's been getting huge push into HPC recently, hmm. back into HPC. I mean, ever okay. since the Opteron days, they were huge in HPC, but the the Roams and uh, other uh high core good cost valuation have like just and massive PCI lanes that they can provide for HPC has kind of pushed their adoption over Intel in many ways for a lot of these new um, exascale and uh, terascale and, and petascale and, and all the other wonderful scales we want to throw in there um, deployments of HPC. So I think that they're seeing Xilinx as kind of a way to help bridge the gap where like Intel has uh, a lot of, a lot of work into their own um, chips for assisting with interconnect, assisting with uh, um, high speed, uh, high speed memory uh -huh. interconnects, things like that between machines. And I think they're going to kind of leverage Xilinx for some of that. At least that's my, I mean, that's just my off the cuff interpretation from reading a couple news briefs, but. So it's, I mean, cause the, so Intel had been talking about, um, uh, yeah, it was Intel talking about extending the PCMCIA bus, like multi, like rack scale. And I, I, I know they keep talking about it, but I haven't seen anything real. Come out there's a couple real there's a couple real deployments of this um they actually worked with cray to do uh I'm trying to remember the name of the the deployment they did they did this massive deployment where they had uh what was it uh i think it was four thousand and four thousand ninety six or something along those lines cores uh you know one big massive machine that that kind of leveraged that um, bus interconnect between the multiple nodes. So there were disparate nodes, but they they leveraged that interconnect that, that you're talking about, I believe. And so there was one deployment of it, but I don't know that it really went anywhere, as you were saying, because it's such a niche thing that I don't know where don't know where we're going to see it deployed. It also sounds like being a, a one-off, it was likely for um, a government lab that specifically said, here's, build us one of these. Uh, we don't care how it, it works, but this is what we're <laughs> looking for. And they said, okay, because the, that's been going on for since at least the 80s. Yeah. But also- Very much so. think, the Fiber channel stuff, yeah. Yeah, I think that Xilinx, uh, with with Nvidia going for ARM and Intel out there having just spun off Wind River, but still, <clears throat> excuse me, having a good connection. Uh, AMD, I think Xilinx saw writing on the wall that somebody was going to gobble them up, and AMD saw uh, get them while we can because they're 
they're the play in FPGA. I mean, NVIDIA's got the graphics, but Xilinx has the FPGA, and both of those are critical for specific act, specific types of uh, compute in the huge data center. When I was at Intel about three years ago, they were talking about rack scale, but it was a little bit different. The kind of designs I saw was the entire back of the rack was a backplane. And instead of plugging in like individual server modules, you'd plug in like CPU modules, but there was big, there was big as like a one U or two U server, but just CPU modules. And the same with memory modules and storage modules and interconnect modules. But there was the size of one U and two U servers and the entire back of the rack was a backplane. I thought that was pretty interesting. That, that was the vision that they had, yeah. We actually did that at MassPAR. That's rack scale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think that the challenge they ran into is the unit economics never got there. And the specialty cars like getting GPUs into the rack scale architectures, they were like, you know, still two years down the road. I mean, Ericsson tried pretty hard yeah. in that space. And then, you know, we looked at it pretty hard because obviously it was internal. And the problem with it is I couldn't get the economics any better. Right. It was you're putting in a one U of CPU and memory. Um, and that was the smallest I could actually do. Right. You couldn't aggregate or further divide those things out of what they refer to as virtual pods. And so with a lack of GPU support, with a lack of advanced network capabilities, I mean, yeah, they had an optical backplane. Um, and then just the pure cost of it. And then like the minimal deployable size was a rack. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think they just ran into a bunch of issues in, in, you know, it was cheaper to deploy more traditional servers. And, and the thing they couldn't break was really the memory bus. You couldn't separate the CPUs from the memory. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where it kind of destroyed the economics. It's interesting. I, Yeah, commodity commodity is a, a powerful, powerful force. <laughs> I'm thinking about um, I spent a little bit of time in a company that had tried to be a uh, InfiniBand company, and um, they InfiniBand was like, "Oh, we're faster than you know Ethernet," and they just never could stay faster or cheaper. Yeah, I was going to say it's too expensive, right? No, oh, yeah, MyraNet also is faster, and yeah, you'll see Ed, you'll see certain HPC deployments that leverage MyraNet and things like that. But yeah. again, it's it's so niche that the cost has to be so high. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, but, but but it's not converged. Let's add converged <laughs> everything. It's converged. That's Sorry. Kit's fault. That's all Kit's fault. <laughs> I do appreciate the Halloween backdrop. <laughs> ah. Hey, Kit, I haven't seen you in about a year in person, actually. I know. Been forever. It's been a while. Everything. Well, this whole last, whatever, six months feels like a decade. So. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. It does. It's crazy. It's been, yeah. Although it's not, you know, it's nice that we have something like these lunches. We can we get to connect on a regular basis. I've sort of been fun from that oh, perspective. Nice. I'm I looking at David. Looking, looking forward to it. Yeah. I was looking at David, waiting for the beads. I'm like, where where's the fun at? Come on, man. <laughs> I'll throw <laughs> them if you can catch them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw them if you can catch them, Larry. <laughs> hey, I'll catch them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We did we did a uh, a pass a, like a like a pass the slap like a, a hand toss thing for, through his in, which was really hard surprisingly hard yeah because everybody's off, off everybody's right? in their own their yeah. own uh, square yeah and, and they're not consistent squares <laughs> it's like doing the wave <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny did we have an agenda for today? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning a little piece. Oh, of yeah, we know we do. Kit. So Kit's I was Kit's arguing with a cola. <laughs> <laughs> Kit's here to talk about SmartNex. So remember a couple of weeks ago, we did the watch party? Mm -hmm. That was for Kit's session. Um, and we had some really good questions and dialogue about it. And I asked Kit to come in and, and 
sort of join join the discussion. That was it was always our hope that we would we would have sort of an interactive discussion after the watch um, with Kit actually, and so that has we've been able to materialize it. it just took <laughs> a couple of weeks. It had to get pandemic, a story. pandemic time. It's everything stretched out. <laughs> so, uh, um, right, Rob, and, Rob, hey, Rob, yeah, I said Kit had to get his story tight. Had to get it right and tight. He's had some rehearsals since. I know then. he's had a little bit of time. <laughs> had to get ready for you guys. I know. <laughs> I, I did. I watched you give the presentation a second time at uh, at uh, Cloud um, Field Day. Oh right, 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 right. That. Yeah, with um, um, what's his name from Pensando? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Pippin, Pippin. Yeah, so, yeah, I've done a few of these. So, uh, <laughs> you know, have more interactive conversation here for sure. Cool. So how does this work? Um, it's, a, it's a webinar. So are other yeah, people going to join? I, I, I do a webinar because it makes the registration easier so people get reminders. Okay. And then I just I promote everybody to be a participant okay, as long as I know who they are. Wasn't sure. Or, yeah. And then he puts me on mute, so. It does give me extra power, um, but uh, now it's with, this is it's designed to be a discussion. But we have, um, you know, you know, as the you know, we asked you come in to come in as the leader because this is your topic. Um, sure, sure. And so it's helpful if you if you you know probably has everybody seen the the I, I can't anytime you ask this question only one person has to say no, so it's never worth asking the question. Can you give us a five minute snapshot um, just yep. to re reset so everybody's up to speed? Sure. Uh, find the PowerPoint here. And, and the PowerPoint is linked to the event in uh, Cloud 2030. Yeah, so it's, uh, this is kind of the, the shortened version. Uh, I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, and um, then we can dive into all the all the topics and discuss topics and discussions here. <clears throat> okay, so um, you know, kind of on the Xilinx thing, actually, I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing is the the slowing of Moore's law um, for core, uh, you know, server CPUs, and what that's created is this kind of fracturing or disaggregation effect. Um, and you see people kind of run into all sorts of different hardware accelerators that try and make up the gap <clears throat> and the, the compute that's required. And you know, we see a lot of these different apps actually driving uh, a lot of that behavior. And again, I'm not saying this is good or bad, I'm just saying what, what we're seeing. <clears throat> um, cloud native apps, 5G, et cetera, create a lot of uh, east-west traffic. Uh, and so that you know, puts additional strain on the network. ML apps, anything that's data-centric, I was moving a lot more data, so just overall throughput is needing to go up. And then also, you know, there, there's a number of security challenges as we start to look at much more distributed applications across, let's say, public cloud and, and on-prem. Uh, and we are starting to see customers doing this. But in the end, what this was necessitating is really some fundamental changes in the underlying hardware architecture. You know, before, you know, we could basically uh, because of the continually rapid increase of uh, CPU power, core CPU power, we kind of just do everything there. And, you know, there are things in the past like TCP offload engines and so forth. Um, but then, you know, the x86, I would always sort of catch up and uh, accelerate beyond it. And, and the speci specialization wasn't really necessary. I think what we're seeing here, uh, I think it will be a permanent change for a number of reasons we can talk about later. But... In the interim, what, what we're seeing is that as we go toward 100G or 400G or whatever type NICs, um, the, the IO processing for that is really, really high. And being able to offload that, you know, get it off of the core x86 CPU, which you, know, you can be taking up 30% or more of that CPU just to do network IO processing, uh, put it onto the actual NIC and optimize that so that, um, you know, it's much faster right there on the data path, that's like a huge win. <clears throat> Uh, this notion of being able to give dynamic access to GPUs or FPGAs or storage or what have you. There's things, some things right now that are happening like NVMe over fabric. It's a very specific thing for storage, but 
you know, are there more generalized solutions to build to deliver the right sorts of hardware capabilities to the right application, irrespective of where it's running? And then, you know, leveraging more hardware security kind of root of trust type capabilities uh, to enable uh, the zero trust security model. So, um, you know, if we look at where we are today, kind of as I mentioned, we're not really there yet. Um, for, well, I can kind of skip this slide, I think. But but what we're going to see is kind of these increasing um, costs that are there, more, more and more x86 CPUs and, you know, just unsustainable increase in TCO. So what are we doing with Monterey? Well, Monterey is really leveraging the SmartNIC fundamentally uh, to rethink our hardware architecture. If you think about what we announced last year at VMworld with Pacific, Project Pacific was where we integrated Kubernetes into vSphere and into VMware Cloud Foundation, kind of changing the top half, if you will, uh, of the offering, making it a, a more Kubernetes native, Kubernetes centric experience. This is really the bottom half uh, with Monterey rethinking the hardware architecture, leveraging SmartNIC as that sort of core building block, and then getting all sorts of benefits <clears throat> around that, uh, including being able to support bare metal, uh, which we think is pretty cool. <clears throat> so, you know, what, what our initial testing has shown is that we can get much, much better performance uh, with this type of approach. Uh, again, and it's not just driving up overall bandwidth, which of course you know, that it is about that, but it's also reducing latency and not just latency, but actually jitter. So for applications that are extremely sensitive uh, to slight variations in performance, we can actually improve that uh, dramatically here. And so again, you know, when you look at trying to deal with uh, an x86 CPU, the sort of interrupts you're getting, you know, top half versus bottom half handlers, uh, dealing with traffic on the PCI bus, these things can get in the way of, you know, really streamlined performance uh, from a networking perspective. And so by offloading that to the NIC, we can really simplify a lot of that and uh, get much more deterministic in the performance. We also believe this can simplify operations uh, in many different ways. Uh, public clouds are using a lot of these approaches to dramatically simplify their operations, bringing in bare metal server support, uh, lifecycle management, a bunch of other things. And as we mentioned, uh, we can also offload security to the NIC um, and be able to do a lot more security analysis type things and enforcement uh, without any sort of performance trade-off, right? Not slowing down the network for that. <clears throat> so I, I think, assume everyone knows what a smart NIC is, but essentially a smart NIC is just a NIC with a general purpose CPU complex on it. Essentially a server running there uh, on the NIC. It's got its own port for management, uh, but what it also can do is virtualize uh, devices uh, on the PCI bus. So what does that mean? Well, normally you plug the card in, PCI bus will see it, it'll see, hey, it's a, it's a NIC, right? Um, and that's great. But what this thing can also do is kind of fake it a little bit on the PCI bus as if there's additional devices connected in that, in that physical slot. It can look like there's an NVMe device or um, any sort of PCI device, really. And so um, this is kind of like a, a different sort of hardware virtualization uh, that we can do to essentially manage and you know, add new virtual devices, physical virtual devices, however you want to call them, uh, to the x86 side. So we'll sort of talk about how that looks. <clears throat> so from a vSphere architecture, ESX architecture, this is kind of the transformation that we're talking about where we can move from the traditional model on the left where everything runs just on the normal x86 core CPUs, uh, CPUs to the right-hand side where we still have the compute hypervisor running up there, but most of the other ESX functionality is now running on the smart NIC on that general purpose CPU. We can put storage there, we can put networking security and host management. And so the host management thing's pretty cool because uh, we can uh, start treating the OS that's running on the x86 side in some ways like a VM. It's you know a, a disk image that's there. We can boot it. We can reset it. We can kind of control you know different elements of it, and we can do that irrespective of whether it's ESX or Linux or Windows. Um, for all of those, you know, we are exposing what appears to be to ESX or Linux or Windows, physical devices, like a physical NVMe device, physical uh, NIC, et cetera, even though they're actually virtual devices exposed from the smart NIC. So we are doing virtualization still, but it's kind of this hardware enabled virtualization that's different from the traditional compute virtualization that we've already uh, always done uh, with ESX. <clears throat> so again, this is 
not just for performance. There's a lot of these interesting operational elements that start to come into play. And this means we can you know, deliver vSAN capabilities, NSX capabilities, security, et cetera, to bare metal Linux and Windows uh, systems in, in this scenario. And then if you kind of expand out looking at a multi-host type of configuration, where you have a bunch of uh, hosts with, that are enabled with smart NICs, what you can do is then start remoting some of these physical devices. So you may have a set of hosts with G GPUs and FPGAs, other hosts without them. But if an app's running on that other host, uh, you can remote that FPGA across uh, some sort of interconnect uh, so that the application can, can use it. And again, this all happens with the magic of smart NIC. But we also need um, a high-speed interconnect, uh, whether that's CXL or Gen Z or so something coming in the future uh, in the next year or two. Kind of assuming that for this like glory, you know, uh, glorified Nirvana future state where we we had the, this fully just aggregated, uh, fully composable type of architecture. But we think that something is really powerful, and this notion that um, instead of having today in the hyperconverged model, where where the best practice is to make every host identical. Uh, which can increase costs. And maybe every host doesn't need to have a GPU. Maybe just some hosts do. That's okay in this model, right? You actually get the sort of flexibility, the ability to reduce costs, while the capex, while at the same time actually simplifying operationally as well. And so it's kind of a best of both worlds scenario. So that's a really quick uh, run through of uh, what Monterey is all about and some of the benefits of it. So again, it's pr pretty exciting stuff, um, and happy to answer any questions on it. Oh, there's so many layers. <laughs> yeah, where to start? What vendors are being supported with this now? Is this this I, a Pensando? I'm sure is one. I mean, uh, so we have, we have three three launch partners, each of um, from the SmartNIC side and from the server OEM side. So on the SmartNIC side, it's Pensando, uh, Mellanox slash Nvidia, and then Intel. Okay. And then on the server OEM side, it's Dell. Um, uh, Lenovo and HPE. Okay, cool. What's the time frame of this hardware availability? We um, are announcing right now, we're not announcing any specific time frame for GA. What, what we announced is essentially a tech preview, which is saying, hey, this is something that we're really interested in. We think it's useful. We want to get a lot more uh, visibility into it and feedback. Um, and you know, actively working with these partners as well, um, both on the technology side as well as on joint accounts. In some practical terms, let's say it's a hundred gig server, and you have well, number one, why don't they have a card with just CPUs on it and not necessarily an integrated NIC? What benefit does a NIC on the card give? Sure. Number two, if you have a hundred gig server large enough, that's basically comparable to 10, 10 gig servers, how much power does this con consume? I mean, are we going to have a data center rack where we can only put one, one server in it because it's using so much power? <laughs> yeah. So interesting question. So on the first one, um, so let's talk about the use cases, uh, so technical use cases for this. Because yeah, it's not just a case. I mean, you can get more cores. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. So I think we're talking about a couple of things. So the first one is where you have a um, some sort of functionality that will benefit from being directly on the data path in the NIC. And so you can do, uh, you get extremely low latency access to that and uh, you know high bandwidth, high throughput, obviously. So those sorts of workloads. So again, something like uh, vSAN where you're exposing um, uh, the storage properties, NSX, obviously, because the network is already flowing through. I mean, well, in vSAN, it's going usually through the NIC as well for all the I.O. <clears throat> NSX, all the I.O. is coming through there. So, you know, being right there makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, even security things where, again, you can do sort of inline security. So, again, they're like, you know, if you think about it from a host perspective, you're, you could potentially be like a little bit of hairpinning or, you know, if, if you like keep everything on the Core x86 CPUs, you got to take it off the NIC process it, put it back on the bus, do something else with it. So there's a lot of these sorts of movement within the host that, that you're doing, uh, which is going to reduce throughput, increase latency, increase overhead, et cetera. <clears throat> Putting them on the NIC is a good sort of technical solution uh, to that. And, and so, you know, that, that would be 
as opposed to something that I don't know, whatever. It's just like you know, you're doing pure um, uh, compute-related stuff. I'm trying to think, like calculating pi or whatever. That's not going to do any better on a NIC than it would on the regular CPU. So just right, keep, keep it on the regular CPU. <clears throat> so generally speaking, you know, the way we see it is this is really about initially kind of you know the infrastructures. Uh, vendors software going on that NIC. Um, that way it's very transparent to the applications. They can take advantage of it, they can benefit from it, uh, but they don't need to know really what's happening behind the scenes. And the fact that the CPU is ARM, so there's a whole bunch of work to do to support ARM type processors. Um, so that's use case number one, where you're doing like data processing and you want to do that in line uh, with the data. Now, another use case that's sort of interesting is again for an infrastructure vendor where we have uh, a lot of appliances. Well, let's take vCenter. Uh, eventually it'd be nice to be able to run vCenter here as well. So again, further reducing overhead that's running there on the x86 side. And the idea there is like, hey, you know, it uh, should just be kind of part of the system, kind of built in, you don't think about it, you just kind of have, have the, the NIC and you know, that's where the stuff runs. And um, you know, a very concrete example of that would be things like, uh, VMware Cloud and AWS Outposts. Now, you know, the, the way this works is that on VMC and AWS, we do have an, a, a set of VMs that actually run outside of our SCDC in the, uh, in just in EC2, which is easy. You fire up a VM in EC2, we start working with our SCDC and everything. Everything works there. That does, you know, various sorts of routing and other things. That's hard to do on-prem with Outposts because now we need another physical server to run this VM. But of course, the physical servers are enormous. This VM's tiny. So why not just run that VM on the NIC, on the smart NIC? You know, there's, there's other potential uses, uh, you know, we're looking through, does it make sense as a vSAN witness node? There's po uh, positives and negatives to it, but those sorts of things, right? So again, those things are not necessarily data intensive, but they are uh, additional overhead, additional manageability overhead, uh, as well as compute overhead, that we can just move off and, and have people stop caring about, right? So, um, and then you can expand further. So we can imagine opening this up that there are partners uh, maybe in the security network security space that today have physical appliances. Well, if we can open this up so they can then move directly onto the smart NIC and not need that physical appliance anymore, well, that gets interesting as well because now it makes it much easier for them to do that. They can actually do a much more distributed type of thing uh, across all the smart NICs instead of just having you know, a few physical appliances out there. And then finally, there's this notion of um, if you think familiar something like eBPF and Linux, <clears throat> this notion of being able to let applications start taking advantage of this. So if an app knows, or, uh, well, an app can program itself in such a way that if it's running on a smart NIC, it, it can take advantage of that offload for additional performance. So maybe in the normal case, it works fine just with a regular NIC, but if it's a smart NIC, a certain set of the application code could actually run on the smart NIC. So now you're actually getting to the point where, you know, customer applications are getting a little bit smarter about it than taking advantage of that. So those are some of the different use cases. But look, if it's just about having more core compute, uh, agreed, it's, it's, it's not that interesting, right? Just go back to, the, to, the, to add more cores uh, to the x86 uh, server CPU. Um, but we do think there's a lot of use cases where this, is, this, this architecture makes a lot of sense, has unique value compared to just tossing more CPUs at it. So I don't know if that answers. That first I've been a, it, it does. I've been a proponent of larger ESXi hosts for a long time, for like 10 years, where common, common practice was smaller ESXi hosts. So yeah. this fits very well into that model. There's this fluid computing concept that I have. The idea is virtualizing everything, routers, firewalls, load balancers, and all yeah. the vendors, I think, tier one vendors, all have virtual appliance versions of these. So it really can turn almost like generic compute into any yep. functionality you're looking for at any one time. It just kind yeah. of makes this fluid computing concept I have become much more reality. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you look at what like AWS is doing, for instance. So the, the other thing that's like really interesting about the SmartNIC is its versatility. <clears throat> because of the fact that it, it can expose virtualized devices onto the PCI bus, it, it's really kind of a chameleon in that it can be whatever you want it to be on the fly. So it's not some preset sort of hardware thing. Like you can control it with software to say, hey, in this moment, I want you to be 
NVMe device. In this moment, I want you to be a NIC. So what AWS does is they have probably like three or four, I think, um, in their Nitro architecture, they have three or four of these smart NICs per host. <laughs> so like every one of them has three or four. And you know, one of them is a host controller. One of them is just a NIC. One of them is a storage controller. Maybe there's a backup NIC or something, you know? And so what's, what's cool about it is that it actually makes the hardware footprint identical across all these different hosts. So they all have the same stuff in them. But at runtime, via software, you can actually control what they're doing. And so, you know, it gets back to this, this fluid notion you talked about. Yeah, instead of kind of having to like pre-configure all the right hardware appliances in the right place, it's one of those things where you can actually do it on the fly with software and really automate that whole thing. You can really stand it up, use Terraform or whatever it is, uh, to fully automate that whole environment, which I think is something like super powerful. And again, another one of the, I think the, the really critical uh, benefits of smart NICs are allowing that sort of software manageability of hardware, something that that kind of combination we haven't exactly had before. I have exactly. to say though, this I think is that's terrifying the to me. <laughs> terrifying? All I hear is, is where is the malicious code now hiding? <laughs> sure. <clears throat> Anytime you increase complexity, especially at this at this scale that we're talking about, and 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 you know massive deployments, and and where where is the tap hiding? How close to the data is the tap? Hmm. Uh, well, yes. Now I can leak. Now I can leak data directly from my NIC out to the world. You know, it's kind of like some of the malicious code that used to hide inside of TCP/IP offloading cards. Um, <laughs> You know, that is true. stuff like that. that. That's what I hear. Uh, and I mean, maybe that's just my yep. my gray hat that pops on occasionally and, and freaks um, me out. But Well, look, I mean, I think we've got a, so a couple of things, right? So they're definitely building in various sorts of roots of trust and uh, uh, attestation and so forth, support into the cards. Because you're right. Like, we got to be able to know what code is running on there. Has it been validated or not? And so, you know, I think there's a couple of things. So number one, I think the industry's moved really far forward since you know the last time around the smart NICs were a thing. Um, with a lot of like the, the core sort of hardware root of trust uh, and that that sort of you know secure boot type of models. Not to mention like if you look at what's happening um, in the container space, let's say, and, and um, container registry is what we can do in terms of uh, container signing and automated CVE scanning. There's like there's a lot of this kind of stuff that's coming together to enable us to better automate a lot of these like security best practices. And you know you're correct that it's, like, there's no panacea for it, but I think we are getting to the point where um, you know we can have a lot more confidence and immediate auditability of what's actually running out there in, in that environment. Hey, Kit, do you ever see like um, ESXi, so vSphere ARM running on these smart NICs as an option? Is there, <laughs> I see Rob giggling, <laughs> I, but I, so, so if so, we're sorry, controlling. Saying, sorry, what's the question? ESXi running on the smart NICs? Yeah, so like vSphere, so like a hypervisor, you know, the vSphere yeah. hypervisor ARM. Is no, that that's an exactly, option? That's, that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, okay. That I wasn't, yeah. okay. Have that working today, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. So, I so didn't that's, see all yeah, this. So, so, that's so good. To, yeah, so the, the V1 of this is it doesn't have to be ESX. It could be Linux that we're running there, right, but right. we're choosing to run ESX because that's our you know platform in our future direction. And right. so initially, we're not going to be really running any VMs. We'll just be running user level stuff. Um, but over time, yeah, we want to be able to run VMs. And as I said, you know, we want to be able to run our management stack. Now it's gonna take a while to get there because our management stack's built for x86, not for ARM, so it's gonna take a while to <laughs> re-architect all that. But, um, but that is directionally, I think, where we wanna go. And okay. over time, it's like vCenter, NSX Manager, all these things just run on the smart NIC uh, as part of. As containers, done and all. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, like, you know, <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff we're doing to containerize them and so forth, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, that, that would help. That would help on the performance overhead from uh, not needing a full OS. Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, right? These are, although uh, GPUs have gigs of RAM, so you know maybe maybe we're not worried that worried about a lot of RAM processing on on these other cards. But um, that's amazing. 
Yeah. Boy, I have a I have a comment and then a question. <laughs> Let me do the part of part of what it strikes me as is that there's a really good abstraction boundary in the PCI bus where you can say, hey, we know what a device looks like now. Like it's such a beaten down standard. It's like if you want to talk networking, here's what that interface looks like. If you want to talk storage, here's what that interface looks like. And so it's a really well known API. Yep. Um that you know, so if you drop in a PCI you know, interface on a system and it conforms to a known good NIC or storage device or memory device or a GPU device, what you put, you could do, you can start getting clever behind it, which makes, I mean, to me, the, the whole thing makes perfect sense. It drives me nuts that it's called a smart NIC instead of like a PCI, you know, bus interpreter. I had something else, but yeah, I got to get over that just like I get over server. I think Gartner calls it a function offload adapter or something like that. I don't know what he calls yeah, it. Yeah, so I don't, totally can count on Gartner to name things badly. So X NVIDIA calls it a DPU. So everyone's got a slightly yeah. different name. I actually, yeah. But so when I think about it that way, though, I mean, what we're really talking about is a new supervisor, right? You're, this is like, cause you, and you started this with yeah. like, this is a next generation of hardware. So I'm, I'm interested yeah. to talk through this idea of, this is actually a whole new way to supervise the main compute. Yeah. Like how, how far down the rabbit hole does that go? Oh, I mean, so, you know. It, All the way. <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah, yeah. So it I think is. there's, I think the jury's still out on some parts of it, but so I, I think a couple of things, right? Like. Um, you know, the BMC is still there in the server. Uh, that's not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, that independent management port I talked about in the smart Nick, you can use that or you can just use the BMC to kind of manage everything. You know, we are working with the server OEMs to, um, construct kind of separate power uh, capabilities, power cycle capabilities for, you know, the motherboard versus the smart NIC. So smart NIC can actually continue running while the rest of the motherboard is reset. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that being, you know, and, and, and that model, the ESX running on the smart NIC actually becomes kind of the primary one and the controller, if you will. Right. So there's a few different models that we're looking at in terms of manageability. The first model says, you know what, as a customer, they don't really care about the smart mix there. There's two ESXs that we, like in vSAN, they just want to see one ESX. Kind of, we can cover the whole thing up, make it all look like it's all one, one happy thing. Um, but we think that there's a lot of use cases for the second model, which is actually showing two separate ESXs. And so in that model, what you can do is, you can imagine like a service provider uh, using ESX to deliver a bare metal service or hardware as a service to their customers. And so they manage the ESX on the smart NIC and then that they basically hook that up to an API that says, you know, give me a bare metal server. They, you know, take the image and, and pop it down there. All security is done on that smart NIC ESXi because all IO has to go through it. So it can do any sort of security really lock down that the physical network <clears throat> to ensure that, you know, the, the tenant isn't doing anything crazy. And then, you know, maybe there is, maybe the tenant installs ESX on there. And so that case there'd be two ESXs, but they're managed by different people. Uh, the provider managing the, the smart NIC version and then the tenant managing the x86 one. <clears throat> so we think this is all, and in fact, that latter model I just mentioned is exactly what AWS does with their Nitro architecture. So again, it's right. proven out that you can do it. Um, could, could this oh, yeah, so the then like the question is over time, how far do we go? Does it ever replace a BMC? Yeah, I don't know about That's, that. That was, that was going to be my, because BMC is like, it, you know, while there are nowadays are all Linux systems, we're still really API protocol Linux focused on them. Let's say let's say Linux ish. Linux ish. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, but but it's like managing them. You know, if they're actually running a computer, right? They're very they're firmware. They're not. It's Linux ish from that perspective. You know, switches mm -hmm. are making more progress here, right? A switch. You know, they're actually installing Linux on a switch, and you can yep. manage the switch. Yep. Um, I, it strikes me that this could be a whole new gener you know, a whole new generation of server architecture. Like if we actually yeah. said, all right, we're, we're tired of BMCs. They're, they're pain yeah. in the butt. Well, so, you, you can actually imagine a lot of really interesting things happening. Um, I think, yeah. you know, so we're talking about like a number of 
vendors out there doing interesting things like rethinking hardware networking architectures. I think in general, the, the sort of cluster architecture that we're getting to, especially with things like CXL, you can imagine that like the cluster itself is just interconnected with CXL and only has mm -hmm. like one or two or three kind of uh, IP, TCIP based pipes coming out of it, but everything inside the cluster is all CXL based or something like that. And so that starts to get like really, really interesting. And then like that goes toward that composability. And so then that, you know, and then, you know, rack scale, right? You just start looking at the rack as like a unit of compute and like everything within it is pretty much shareable between each physical node and all sorts of crazy this interesting things start to happen. So I think what, what I see that's enabling all this is if I take a step back, um, you know, what, what's going to matter from a kind of server, I don't know what you would call it, server architecture standpoint, is really like what's happening with what we're doing with Dimension, what AWS is doing with Outposts, what Azure is doing with Azure Stack, or Microsoft's doing with Azure Stack, which is that you're going to get these like kind of vertically integrated offerings. Um, and that's all that's going to matter in like 10 years. Right? You're not going to be able to still like build your own. There's no like random cobbling things together. It's all going to be part of one of the major clouds. Our cloud kind of being this horizontal cloud that layers on top of the other ones. And, um, and so because of that, like you're just, everything's going to be kind of a service, like, and you're not really going to care how it's implemented. Just like, you don't really care how exactly Nitro works. You're like, oh, AWS is giving me a, a machine. That's great. And, um, and so I think because of that, you know, you look at these outpost racks and like what we do with dimension, the rack just comes in. And so that actually gives us tremendous flexibility to find a fundamentally better way of delivering whatever functionality we need to. And what that will uh, naturally gravitate toward is much more efficient, much more, uh, cost effective, i.e. cheaper, uh, and better performance, you know, ways of doing it. And so that's naturally where things are going to go. Um, it's the same thing that kind of happened in the public cloud. We're now going to see that happen on prem as well. And so I think that's going to really fundamentally change, uh, some of the cluster architectures because it can now be so prescriptive because it's kind of delivered as a service. So that's maybe one of my more controversial statements, but maybe not. I don't know. I actually kind of like that statement. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there a licensing model that sort of supports the explosion of, you know, if I, if I decide to put four of these in every machine I build tomorrow and I have a hundred thousand machines, now I have half a million ESX license instead of a hundred thousand. So, which is great for my sales guy, yeah. but not so good for my bottom line. So, well, yeah, I, I mean, it wouldn't be, we haven't figured out the exact price and we're not going to charge you two X like, cause there's two ESX hosts or two ESX instances. Mm -hmm. There might be some Somewhere additional charge. That. <clears throat> Sorry. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, we got to figure it out. Well, clearly there's some value that we're delivering here. So like, what's the value of that value or whatever? Uh, so we got to think through that. It's not going to be like a 2x thing or anything like that. So <clears throat> you mentioned uh, uh, high-speed interconnect. Uh, how do you actually see that? Where is it? between the uh, smart NICs or yeah. it, okay yeah. so that's like i have a tendency to think in the simd mimd model of the world the uh, hpc and essentially the smart NIC becomes the the control computer so the the coordinator of the tens of thousands of uh processors and run it bare metal uh, with all the interconnects and whatnot. And so that that high speed interconnect between the NICs is just critical for management, especially across racks. So you can go beyond rack the rack to the entire data center. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and again, we're getting kind of far ahead and trying to read the tea leaves a little bit. So it's hard to say exactly how it'll go. Um, but you know, I think there's all sorts of interesting innovation that can happen. Like we were talking to this, what was their name? Some networking company that was basically looking at, um, a switchless architecture where it's kind of all done in the NIC. And, mm -hmm. and so for, you know, they can get thousands of machines into that thing and theoretically get better performance. And, and typically, you know, the challenge with these sorts of approaches is that it's just too hard to rip out what you already have, but. If it's this notion of, hey, like I'm gonna put down like all these outposts or dimension racks or whatever, 
then that starts to change the calculus a little bit. So I think it is going to be some of these like really prescriptive kind of out of the box uh, solutions. They're going to sort of open up uh, the opportunities a bit to really rethink how things are done. And of course, we're not you know necessarily shooting for any of that yet. Honoré and what we're talking about SmartNix fits squarely into the existing um, network architecture that's out there today, but I think it will give us an ability to sort of move forward uh, at some point in the future. Hey, Ken, you, had comment, uh, sorry. You, you had talked about uh, zero trust networking. What role do you see the SmartNix playing in zero trust? Yeah. So I think it's about doing local enforcement of uh, security policies. So, you know, anything that should be blocked, like never will hit the wire anywhere, right? Uh, whereas today, a lot of that has to be stopped at some physical switch. So it's already gone through the wire or a physical firewall, whatever it is. So it's already gone through the wire, potentially through a switch um, and so forth. And so, you know, um, and it, it also allows you to have a lot more context in terms of that, because you know we're sitting there on the server, we understand uh, some of the applications that are running there, and can can just be a bit smarter about it. So it's kind of connecting some of those two things. But essentially, zero trust means um, that traditional security perimeter model, where everything outside is untrusted, everything inside's trusted. We're now saying, hey, like everything's untrusted except for these very small, you know, points of trust. And you can get a lot more um, uh, specific about that. As to my comment, this could drive like a five thousand dollars server running fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars worth of software, being all virtualized network appliance mm -hmm. licenses. Well, it makes, uh, makes the servers much more um, required for reliability. Um. So, well, I don't know about the cost comparison there. I, look, I mean, you still need a lot of hardware. <laughs> That's not going to go away. You still, like, you know, there's got to be a GPU somewhere to do all the work uh, of a GPU. But I think there's a couple of things. So number one, um, yes, the cost uh, uh, will increase. Like the cost of a smart NIC is clearly more expensive than a regular NIC because you got you know a whole set of ARM uh, cores there as well as some memory <clears throat> and maybe like a little um, uh, flash, you know, persistent storage. Anyway, point being that um, the price will go up. Now we have done a lot of initial pricing analysis and. It seems that from a CapEx standpoint, you know, moving to a smart NIC architecture is absolutely cheaper. Um, just looking at that compared to uh, the x86 costs and, you know, trying to run some, again, it's not exactly, well, exactly apples to apples, but if we do the various benchmarks, this is kind of the early data that we're seeing. So I think there's already uh, savings there. And what we also think, as I said before, that there's a lot of operational and other types of savings uh, that come into it as well. So. Um, so, you know, the, the cost profile there is still unfolding. Um, I'm sorry, it's kind of what I was getting at is that I uh, absolutely believe that the cost of the hardware would go down, general hardware costs, but we would be able to run much more software on those same, on the same server. So, mm -hmm. but the value of that software would be much higher than it is now. Instead of running ten thousand dollars on that server, would be running like fifty to a hundred thousand dollars worth of licenses on that one server. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> yeah, because we can get rid of the overhead, we can leave more space on the x86 um, cores for applications, <laughs> and so yeah, so you know you have more software presumably that, that you're paying for there, or that you developed in house. It's, I think it's fascinating that Amazon's doing multiple smart NICs, right? Some of the is, I mean, some of this used to be F, FPGA, yep. right? You, that would that was the last generation was you have to really know how to program it. This part of the innovation that you're talking about here is making this a much more accessible model for people to. Uh, yeah, that's to part of the power the, of of ARM. You know, just having that more consistent uh, ISA. Mm -hmm. That, you know, there, there's now been uh, a lot of tooling built out for, and that even though the exact ARM processors are different between, you know, different places, um, I mean, obviously it all comes from ARM, but the point is that, yeah, there is that sort of commonality underlying that that allows an ecosystem to start being built up. So it's not this like super, super specialized thing. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's a huge aspect of this um, so that's really important. It kind of goes to the question, Rob's point with the, the multiple NICs, we did that because of limitations in the smart NICs. 
the number of SRIV channels I could actually put on a single uh, night, limited the number of people we could put on. So we had to go to dual. And then limiting it's in the virtualization stack as well. So I, I was just gonna ask you if any of that gotten better. Um that's a good question. Um so I think it is getting better. I don't know the exact uh, specifics. I'm trying to think of like some of the specs. I mean, these cards are just uh, continuing to, to go crazy. Um, you know, massive uh, CPU complexes on them, massive expansion of, of custom ASIC hardware capabilities uh, on it. So, you know, there's kind of the general purpose CPU side, and then there's all the specialized uh, true offload side. And when I say true offload, I mean, that's, you're giving it to a custom ASIC that's going to go just, you know, super efficient uh, process, what, whatever you need to do. The ARM processor is on the card, solar so it's flare. fast. Hmm? Like, like a solar flare or something like that, you mean? Um, oh, never mind. Keep well, going. I just mean like um, if you think about, um, I don't know, they, they have all sorts of like specific APIs you can call on the card to, to do like completely offload the any network IO. And so you basically just give it some data, does all the transformation, everything else, and just takes care of all that stuff for you. Moving all the Those switching function down. Right. Say what? Moving all the switching function down, which is yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all implemented in hardware. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, thing, the challenge you ran into, by the way, was was not it was about abandoning resources. So if I have a a, a bit pumping application, I'm a, a switching application doing SD WAN. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pushing RTMP segments out, right? You, you wind up in the challenge of saying either to hit their performance goals, I can't cost them 30% performance when, when I'm really doing um, segment 40, yep. right? And so either I give them a bare metal box or I basically rely on the smart NIC to get efficiency, right? Yep. And that's really the challenge we ran into. And that's where I said the limitations of things like SRIV really kind of hamstrung us to how much, how uh, many users it. I could put onto that platform. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, one of the things I thought yeah, I, I remember from the public cloud day, public cloud uh, smart NIC push was that the, um, that the actual ASICs weren't keeping up with some of the needs that the public cloud providers had based on densities. And so they were, they, they got tired of, of waiting for the ASIC vendors to make modifications and said, we'll just do it. Cause I mean, well, I, but, yeah, I mean, this I is this unlocks innovation. Uh, that's I guess my point is that unlocks innovation, right? What you're describing yeah. is a is a platform where people can start messing with, you know, you, things you actually put on a bus, and do, rethinking how, well, I, how those interactions go. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's one of, like if I look at AWS, like they operate at such a massive scale, conformity and consistency is really important, and so the fact mm -hmm. they can have a single card do the job of four different cards. Is really powerful for them because that just drives up greater scale. Now they make four X of those cars, but they get that much greater economies of scale and reduce their, their unit costs, you know, all these. And, and, you know, just from an operational perspective, uh, it's very easy. If one of those cars dies, they can quickly go replace it. They don't need to, you know, have different piles of different cars. So like there's those sorts of things I think is what really drove them rather than any sorts of some of these other limitations. Um, that being said, you know, I also think that, that's why they bought Annapurna was to because like they're at such a scale where it just makes sense to do it themselves like cut out the middleman right and like uh, now most of us are not in that position or pretty much all of us are not in that position but they are <laughs> I think to your point it, it does create a, a lot of huge opportunity for, for benefits there well also if you take this out to the edge you can put this in a vehicle and you, and you put the radio on the NIC and suddenly you've got all the multifunctions to talk to edge cloud to do mesh networking and everything else. This mm -hmm. actually really ups the game for automate uh, for the autonomous driving because it gives it the connectivity, especially if you can do the untrusted to do mesh networking plus upload and compute into the cloud. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, you know, having, I think at the edge, it gets especially interesting for a variety of use cases. As I said, like maybe it's, you know, for vSphere, vSAN witness node, we go on this thing. So you can just get two nodes instead of three. And that's like a huge cost savings, actually, and operational simplification. 
Um, One way to look at this from a hardware perspective, it's almost like a blade computer, except instead of blades being more expensive, um, it actually makes it less expensive if you compare it to like blades. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, you, you can't look at it as a general purpose computer, as I said before. I mean, clearly it is a general purpose processor, but like the, the way it's architected, some of its kind of characteristics suit it for specific types of workloads, specific types of use cases, kind of as I enumerated earlier. Um, but yeah, like I think it, you know, the point is it does give you more degrees of freedom uh, and kind of some optionality that you didn't really have before, which I think is really interesting. So I, we, since we're almost out of time, I'm, I'm super curious about how people can play because this, this feels very, you know, sci-fi-ish to me because it just doesn't <laughs> yeah. seem like it's, that easy to get, you know, like, do we, you know, buy a smart neck and start playing with it or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to figure well, out. Well, so, what well, I mean, kind of somewhat relatedly, unrelatedly, just the timing actually worked out really well. So we announced, um, or we released uh, ESXi on ARM Fling, um, uh, basically about a week after we announced Monterey. So, you know, as I mentioned, ESX runs on the SmartNIC. SmartNIC is, you know, today pretty much all ARM-based processors. So we've been working on ESXi and ARM for the last few years. And, um, you know, I kind of was running it the last year and a half or so. And, um, you know, the, the real focus there <coughs> was around trying to find a, a good use case for ARM. And, you know, how do we want to... <laughs> You know, well, you know, like, does it make sense as a main board thing? Does it make sense on-prem? Does it make sense in the clouds and an edge thing? Is there is there a good market for ESX there? In any case, you know, the, the one we kind of landed on in the end was SmartNix because uh, for all the reasons we just talked about. But at the same time, we're still exploring and wanting to get feedback from people on what they'd like to use this for. And so that's where the, the fling happens. So the fling is just a standard VMware thing that, that we do. Uh, for getting code out there that is not production ready, so don't go running it, you know, in production. We're not, we don't officially support it, um, but it is there for folks to to play with, to tinker with, to try out different things, to test out ideas, um, and then give us feedback on it. And it's been pretty funny, man. You see, like, you know, we we officially um, support it on a well, not I mean, we, we officially will. Have said, said we've tested it with a few different platforms, one being uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, 4, which is kind of the, the main one. Um, but there's a few others. But people have been doing all sorts of random ARM-based devices. Someone uh, installed it on, on a Nintendo Switch, and the thing booted. <laughs> Just like, no idea. Um, and someone else, someone like installed like on a vacuum or something, something that had an ARM processor. It was crazy. I don't know how they did it. The, anyway. The new Raspberry Pi CM4 um, comes, with an, comes with a PCIe one lane slot that you can use. So that it's, it's not supported on the compute module yet, just the standalone. The CM4? Right. The fling? Yeah. Yeah, it's well, not, it's yeah not, I'm not sure what not it works yet. on. You can always try it. It might work, it might not work. <laughs> well, like, you know, you, basically there's like an email address it's, on the Fling site to contact us. And, you know, we'll try and help people if they try something that doesn't work. Um, because you're basically there, talking directly with the engineering team there. Is there a um, smart NIC emulator like on VMs? Like, like if we were doing a smart switch, we could get a VM and emulate a smart switch. Can yeah. You that? Not really, not today, I don't think. Hmm. That strikes that's that strikes me as a shame. But yeah. I mean you could if you have a smart nick lying around, you could try installing the the fling on it. No idea if that would work or not, but <laughs> might. Uh but yeah, I mean the, the fling's the best way to sort of test out the ARM based ESX and you know, probably the closest thing we have is something that's out there today you can start playing with. Cool. All right, we are at the top of the hour. Kit, this was awesome. Thank you. You're always welcome to come back. We're going to keep talking about stuff like this, and we have you know very interactive conversations. Sometimes rants, <laughs> also. But <laughs> so, thank you for uh, spending your time, your lunch with us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Great discussion. Yeah. yeah thank you. All right. Take care, right, everybody. Right. So long. Right, bye bye. Talk to you See on you election bye. day. Assuming, I'm, I'm oh, assuming yes. we're going to do this on election day. I, I don't oh. have to look at what our. Uh, oh. <laughs>
Can we get our Thanks, virtual Rob. punching bags working by then? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good right. luck. See you guys. See you hey, soon. Rob, I'll, I'll ping you later about that other about crib. I would love to talk. I can hang out in a couple minutes. I'll ping us.